what I want to talk about is I want to kind of review what we've been doing with oral fluid diagnostics the last several years. Uh, so I'm going to start out with a brief introduction and then I'm just going to go down, give about five what I consider key studies that have helped put this oral fluid diagnostics thing into perspective. And so I'm going to review those key studies. But just to start out briefly with this introduction, uh, why this terminology, why do, we, why do we call oral fluid and not saliva? And the simple reason is that oral fluid by definition is what you collect by putting an absorbent advice, uh, device in your mouth and then squeezing the liquid off that device. So oral fluid is what you collect by putting some sampling device in your mouth. Uh, oral fluid has saliva in it because of course you've got your salivary glands here. But also there's a lot of liquid that comes from the capillaries across these, these membranes that line your mouth into that oral fluid cavity. And this liquid that comes across there is very important because they've done, done studies in dogs, for example. You can put a fluorescing dye in the leg vein of a dog and within seconds detect that in oral fluids. Very dynamic. And so that's why these oral fluids are picking up what's in serum as well as detecting what's produced locally. For example, there's, there's PERS virus replicating in tonsils. So you've got both those sources of antibodies and pathogens. And so I've already said, why is it a good uh, diagnostic specimen? It's dynamic. It's picking up antibodies and uh, pathogens from locally produced stuff. On uh, the human side, it actually has a long history of use. Earliest publication we could find back in 1909 and that's not a misprint of this 1,909, 100 years ago. And in this case, these, these researchers were reporting what we would now call antibodies in oral fluids in people that have been uh, infected with brucella melitensis. So it's an old concept. Uh, the next probably key point for us is this publication in 1986 where these people reported that in HIV infected individuals, they could find antibodies again. In this, in this case, they miscalled them salivary antibodies, but we know what they meant. And so this, in this publication in 1986, they raised the possibility of using oral fluids rather than serum as a diagnostic specimen. On the human side, they worked fairly fast. Their uh, initial antibody detection assays, and they focused primarily on antibodies, not PCR, because PCR wasn't really available then, their initial, their initial antibody studies were coming up with, with test sensitivities of 75 or 80 percent. It was only later that they actually were able to uh, great, greatly improve their testing sensitivity. And now the tests that they use have specificities of nearly 100 percent, sensitivities of greater than 99 percent. Phenomenal test performance. Uh, this oral fluid testing when they first initiate, initiated it in these 10 uh, STD clinics in New York City, immediately saw an increase in 40% in their walking clientele. These are people coming off the street to get tested. They want to find out if they have HIV or not. They're, the increase is simply because of the fact that uh, most of us don't like needles. Oral fluid sample is pretty easy. Here's an individual getting this oral fluid sample. Uh, and so they were able to get, improve their testing, improve their surveillance. They, they uh, have very good estimates as to their false positive rate because in this case, you've got a 20 minute test. This is a 20 minute test that you can actually run either for oral fluids or plasma or serum. It's the same test. So in 20 minutes, uh, sit on heavy cookie. We'll get your results right back to you. If you come up positive, then they draw the blood to confirm that the sample is positive. And so they can very quickly figure out if they've had a false positive reaction. And so, in fact, there's a ton of research on the human side from 1909 to 2009, primary focus on antibody detection, not PCRs like we've been doing. Uh, lots of work on surveillance, huge numbers of tests or studies in HIV, but they've even done such, such things as uh, mail-in surveys for measles. So you send these, these samples out. Uh, there's a large study in England and Wales. Uh, the moms were collecting these samples at home from the kids. You put the sample back in the envelope, mail it in, 11,000 samples or so. So what I'm talking about is very easy technology that makes testing highly accessible and at a pretty cheap cost. So how about on the pig side? When, when we started out on the pig side, we, I wasn't really aware of any of this stuff on the human diagnostic side. They'd done a lot of the heavy, heavy listing, but really on the veterinary side, we hadn't looked at it at all. 
we began looking at oral fluids because we had this experiment, uh, Bob Rowland at Kansas State was actually PI in this experiment. We were doing the work at Iowa State because we have access to, to good uh, livestock research facilities and we had these, these 109, 109 pigs we were going to infect and then follow over time looking for the rate of persistence over time. And one of the things we discovered in this study was that you could in fact recover infectious virus 175 days after inoculation. But we were at this time doing uh, tonsil scrapings. I don't know if you all ever have done tonsil scrapings. Let me see if the movies will work. So here's tonsil scraping, just so you know what I'm talking about. Not a very good quality of picture. In, in my experience, in my experience, this pig must be on cloud nine <laughs> because my pigs never acted like that. And let me tell you, if you go back three or four times, they go totally bonkers. And so this is, this is a, kind of an idealized tonsil scraping. <laughs> And so, so we were trying to track these guys. We were trying to follow them for 200 days. We originally tried tonsil scrapings, and then that didn't work after they got any size on them. And so this is, if this movie works, so this is a movie from, this is a movie from, from May of 2005, from that group of pigs that we were following. And basically what we were trying here is just to see if we could collect any kind of sample, and you can see, pretty easy to collect a sample. These guys were having a pretty good time. <laughs> and then, once we had the sample, we were submitting them for PCRs just to see what would happen. And kind of to our surprise, um, the results were very, were very uh, encouraging. Dr. Eric Joe, who was head of our serology section at that time, tried some antibody detection. We ran the PCRs, and we're getting positive on both sides. And so then we went ahead and, and wrote uh, a request to NPB for funding, an approved method for PERS surveillance and monitoring. That was 2005. And also got some funding from BIVI, PERS surveillance handling and storage guidelines for oral fluid samples because obviously these are highly contaminated samples. And then uh, also went ahead then in 2008 and published really what you'd say is preliminary studies, prototype studies, is this, the question really being, is this a procedure that we can actually use in a field? And so that kind of set us up. So oral fluid collection from pigs, what, what do we do? Um, we recommend using cotton rope. We looked at lots of different kinds of rope. If you go down to your local hardware store, it's hard to find cotton. You mostly can only find synthetic fibers. The problem is that uh, synthetic does, only holds maybe 50% of the volume that cotton can hold. And also we were concerned if the, cotton, if the rope got in a place where you didn't want it to be, we would have some kind of confidence that cotton would break down over time and synthetics just last forever. Uh, we think it's pretty important that you adjust the rope to the sides of the pig. We'd like to have it to the pig, uh, to the back of the pig so the pig has to reach up. It gets you a cleaner sample. And then extraction is pretty simple. Put it in a bag, put it in a boot, squish it. The liquid flows to, to one side. Uh, we're always going to recommend freezing. Get the sample and freeze it. It's not going to hurt PCRs. It's not going to hurt antibody assays. Uh, and you simply you get great preservation, as we as will indicate. In our experience, in a, in a classic pen size of 25 to 30, 75 percent of the pigs in that pen will be on the rope in a 20 to 30 minute period of time. OK, here's, here's another way of looking at that. Percent of pigs in one pen on a rope, one versus two ropes over time. This, this work is coming out of England. Uh, there are research groups that I'm aware of in Denmark, Spain, Poland, England that are working on oral fluids. So this came out of, uh, this group is apparently the equivalent of the National Pork Board. What, what Yolanda is showing here is that here's our 20 minute period, time period, and she's seeing the same thing we saw, which is one rope in a pen, you get about 20, about 75% of the pigs interacting with the rope. But she took it one step further, she said if you put two ropes in there, you get 90% of the pigs. 90% of the pigs on one of those two ropes in that 20 minute period of time. So that sets up uh, for us the sampling process. Now I know uh, we tend to be 
uh, a very practical, pragmatic, and creative group. And so other people are going to find better ways to improve on what we've done here, both in terms of collecting uh, a sample more representative of the group and in terms of collecting cleaner and better samples. But that's what we're starting for now. So here's a review of the key, of the key studies. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to kind of walk through these five different experiments, showing you the experiment, showing you the results, and the conclusions that we think that we could draw from these, from these studies. The, the very start is problems with PCRs. So this was a, would have been from about two years ago. These 20 samples here on the side are actually the same samples. They all came out of one beaker. The 20 samples out of the same beaker into which we had already put purge fires. And so when we got these results back, they should have all been the same, had the same CTs. And what we see here is some, some variability in CTs, but most importantly, we have all these negative samples. It's the same sample. They should all either be positive or they should all be negative. So we asked the lab to rerun. And what you see is, in some cases, we had the same result, negative, negative. In some cases, negatives went to positive. Here's a negative to positive, negative to positive. These stayed the same. And so we had kind of a protracted discussion, but the bottom line is that the technician who was running these extractions took it upon herself to evaluate five different extraction procedures. Here they are, one through five. Number one is the same as these, pre as these previous two. In this case, you can see that, again, there was some flip-flop on, on extraction number one. Extraction number one is not a good extraction. But we did find some extractions that worked pretty consistently. And so we went with that, and we selected extraction, extraction method number, number three as the one we would use going forward. Uh, we've done subsequent work since then. Uh, Wayne Chittick, who I think many of you know, uh, did additional work, and what he did was he, he compared five more extraction methods, and he compared two ways of doing the PCRs. The only difference here is that this particular method of using PCR has twice the level of, of uh, reverse transcriptase and the polymerase enzymes. So they double the level of the enzymes in these PCRs. The results here, what we're seeing is these are all the same results, or the results from the same 63 uh, samples. These, these, these samples came from pens of pigs that had been inoculated with purge virus, but they were collected over time. So they didn't have to all be positive. But they, in every case, it was the same 63 samples run in, the, in these tests. And you can see we have a low of 11 out of the 63 positive and a high of 35 out of the 63 positive. So there's, there's a big difference. If you run the statistical tests, these samples here in gray are statistically significantly different from this one here. So again, we see that there are major differences in PCRs that have to be addressed. If you look at what, what uh, at the experiment that was put together, it was not a perfect experiment because we weren't able to compare all the different variables across all these extraction procedures. So for example, if you look at sample volume here, in every case, we started with a different sample volume. Could that have had an impact on the results? Probably. What you see here is, is this particular, particular method, which was the best, had a much higher sample volume to start with. And so very likely there was more RNA in there. But there are also more inhibitors because the lesson that we're learning here with this is that there are inhibitors, PCR inhibitors in oral fluids that have to be dealt with. In this case, Wayne was able to deal with the inhibitors by doubling the level of enzymes. So probably what happened here was that this larger sample volume brought down more RNA, but it also brought down more inhibitors. Doubling the en enzymes allowed him to overcome the inhibition and find the RNA that was left. This kind of em emphasizes that. This is, in the particular RNAs, or particular PCRs that Wayne was running, there is an internal control, uh, RNA, that goes in with the thing. And so that if this positive control comes through, you know the test was running correctly. If it doesn't come through, then you know something was wrong with the procedure. What we found is that on the, on the uh, samples that were run by, in this 1x method, 
there were a lot more failures than on the 2X. Doubling enzymes meant that you improved the detection of this internal positive control. The other thing that you see here, very strikingly, is that these samples here, these internal control samples, have a much narrower distribution. These big boxes are, in, are indicating the distribution of the CT values of that internal control. This should be all about the same, because the same amount goes in every sample every time. And so you like these narrow distributions, like this. And importantly, what, what, this, what this is showing is that these narrow distributions, these tight distributions, all come from the samples that had the 2x level of, of enzymes. So we're learning that we have inhibitors in oral fluids that have to be dealt with, and we're learning some ways of dealing with those. Now, in this particular case, they doubled the enzymes, but there's other ways to, to deal with inhibitors, and those need to be explored. But for the short term, you need to make sure that your lab is aware of these problems and has done some kind of verification, some kind of validation of their assay to be sure that their PCR is running well enough on oral fluids. So my take home on this is PCRs are not all created equal. And oral fluids do contain PCR inhibitors that have to be dealt with. This could also relate to the problem we've seen that in some cases, direct sequencing from oral flu fluids has, has failed. And so there's been a question mark, why is it failing? One possible explanation is that these PCR inhibitors are also affecting our ability to sequence directly from oral fluids. So this is not, in my opinion, this is not the end of the story. We made some progress, but we need to make more progress. So we need to continue this process of PCR optimization and you, as a consumer, should check to see which PCR your laboratory is actually running. So that was the first step, that's our first experiment. The second one is looking at uh, per shedding in oral fluid. Now we had the two uh, prototype studies uh, under both experimental and field conditions showing that it worked, but we wanted to go on and look at individual animals, get more precise data on the levels and duration of shedding. And so we looked at, at the three, three trials in uh, 24 bores in each trial. Uh, we looked to see if there was differences based on the isolate of PERS virus that we're using. So we did, in the first trial, we looked at a modified live vaccine. The second trial was looking at a type 1 field isolate. And the third, type, third trial was looking at type 2, actually Minnesota 184, <coughs> the fe another field isolate. In these bores, then we just followed oral fluid and serum through uh, day 21. Uh, we had a total of 72 bores that we were working with, and of the 70, 70 bores, uh, 72 bores, we had uh, excellent success at training 70 of them. And for the most part, uh, the kind of response we see here, the kind of enthusiasm we're seeing here with this guy, is typical of what you get. Uh, it's not difficult collecting from bores, at least the ones that are trainable. In this study, we actually, uh, because we didn't want to fail, we would soak the ropes in apple juice and sugar, and then dry the ropes, and then they put them out. But we've done trials since then with individually created bores, and that's not really necessary. It's still a playful activity that they uh, look forward to, and so you don't actually have to flavor the ropes to get them to go. Um, in total, we had uh, quite good success. Just to show you how, how we collected from these guys, and this is, again, not what I would consider a perfect procedure. It, it worked, but I think it could be improved upon. So I'll cut the rope off, put the rope in a plastic bag, Let's kind of hurry this along a little bit. You can see that you collect a fairly generous amount of sample, and it's a pretty clean sample. So in this case, you'd snip the corner of the bag, decant it into the tube, and off you go. 
So uh, from day one to 21, we had about a 97% success rate. Uh, you can see they're mostly, mostly pretty clean. You can't quite see in the tube here, but the bottom line is five mils. So that'd be five, 10, you're looking at something in the neighborhood of 25 to 30 mils here from an individual bore. So sample volume also is, is uh, pretty easy. So here, we're just, we're just gonna cut right to the results. Here's our three trials, 24 bores in each trial, except for, I think it was this one that had 22. Both of those animals that failed were in this one here. Um, so here's trial one, and the black line at the top is showing the average volume of oral fluid. And that, this axis on the right hand side here is showing you that volume. So here's five mils, 10 mils, 15, 20 mils, and so you can see for the most case, the mean volume collected from these bores was about, was in excess of 15 mils. And that's true for each, for each study. So this was, this, this trial here is Minnesota 184, which we consider more pathogenic. And I think you have the impression that there was a, a somewhat of a decline in the mean volume we collected from bores, but there was no impact on success rate. So even acute infection, you continue to collect samples successfully although you may have a lower volume. Uh, what we see here, we, the black line, okay, the black line is the volume of oral fluids, the red line is PCRs on serum, and the blue line is quantitative PCRs on, on uh, oral fluids. Uh, looking at the red lines, you can see that between uh, MLV and this type one virus and this uh, type two Minnesota 184, there is a difference in the level of viral replication, Minnesota 184 being replicating to a much higher level than, than the other two. And that's consistent with what we think we know. Um, the blue line, again, is, is oral fluid PCRs. And you can see for a large, to a large extent, they track pretty well with serum. You do see higher levels of, here, of, of uh, virus in serum for some period of time but then they kind of tend to decline here day 10, and you can see that oral fluids and serum pretty much match after day 10 in this particular case. You can compare, quantitatively compare, serum and oral fluid PCRs using this area under the curve correlation data. And basically what that is is, is you get a line for each individual bore, and you calculate the volume, calculate the volume of area under each curve. So you can do that for individual bores, looking at oral fluids and, uh, and serum. And then you run the correlation analysis. And you can see that fairly good correlation, nearly a 0.7. Uh, and there's a line. You can see how nicely the data points track together. So to look at this stuff categorically, here's, here's uh, trials one. That's some, that's some modified live. And here's the type one virus. And here's the type two virus. Here's the samples, oral fluid or serum. And here's our days. 0, 7, 14, and 21. Uh, you can see we did have one, we had one false positive PCR. We, do this, we did this study the same we do all our studies. We always collect all our samples, and then totally randomize everything, submit it to the lab, and then get the results back. If we get back a result that we don't like, we never retest. We just report them as they are. And so here is uh, a sample that came back false positive. Uh, the sample, the serum sample for that, for that guy, at that date and all previous dates was negative, so we believe that's a false, false positive. Here's uh, day seven. You can see 69 of 69 oral fluid samples are positive, 70 of 70 oral, uh, serum samples are positive, so 100% agreement. On day 14, we start seeing some discrimination between oral fluids and serum. Here's 64 of 68 oral fluids are positive, 94%. 56 of 70 serum samples are positive, 80%. So we had more positive oral fluid samples than serum. Here's uh, day 21 out here, and we see a widening trend. Here we have 60 of 67, or 90% of the oral fluids are positive, 55 of 70, 80%, were positive on serum. Somewhat surprising, uh, surprising results. One well, you'd kind of expect that serum would last longer, but that wasn't the case in this study for sure. So the take home uh, on this individual study is that you can collect oral fluids from individually housed adult animals. They do need some training. 
the way we train these boars is for, for the first morning, of, actually the first day, to simply throw the rope uh, in the cage in front where they can nose it around, only for 20 minutes, and again in the afternoon. And then most animals after that, once they have some familiarity, will be perfectly happy to interact with the rope that's hanging. Uh, for sure this is a, a welfare friendly approach in terms of disease monitoring and it's a lot safer than trying to collect blood. Uh, and detection of purge by PCR in oral fluids is equal to or better than serum. So that's the second study. Uh, the third study was the limits of detection by PCR. And this, this is an attempt to, to address the question, what's the probability, what's the likelihood that I can find you know, an early infection, the one pig or the first few pigs that kick over on a site, in a barn, whatever. And so in this case we had, we went to a PERS negative site. Uh, in this particular, this is, this is intended to represent one wean to finish barn, it has 40 pens. We only used 36. We had, we had pigs in 36 pens. Um, these are showing the PCR results. Again, typically, and in this study as well, we, we collected all the samples, randomized everything, then ran the PCRs, but I'm showing you the results as we move through time. And so this is, we're going to call this day minus four, but this is actually Monday. So think of this as, this is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. We're collecting all these, all these oral fluid samples from these 36 pens. We had one, again, we had one false positive that's consistent with, the, with my experience with PCR. There are occasional false positives. Now, in addition, back here on Monday, we took 36 pens, or 36 pigs, one from each pen, put them in a different building, and vaccinated them with MLV. And they're also being tested by oral fluids. And you can see they're negative on Monday, negative on Tuesday, and positive on Wednesday and Thursday. So then Thursday night, Thursday night, these 36 pigs were moved back in these pens. One pig went back into each of the 36 pens. So now you have 36 pens, each of which contains one viremic pig. So the next morning, approximately 14 hours after these guys went in there, we went ahead and collected oral fluids. So our assumption was 14 hours is not enough time for them to uh, transmit any other pigs. We still believe we have one viremic pig in each of these pens. So the question is, can we detect them? Okay, so here's, here's our results. This is our results from the Friday morning collection. This is 14 hours after they went in. And we had 23 PCR positive oral fluid samples from these 36 pens. In other words, of those 36 pens with one pig each, we detected 64% of them. We continued following these guys for the, for the following week. And for the following week, we had a total of 252 samples and we had a 77% detection rate. So here's my take home on this study. Here's how I interpret this. If you have 26 pigs in one pen, and one pig is viremic, which is a 4% positivity rate, then you can collect one oral fluid sample and have a 64% probability of detection. Or you can bleed 16 pigs and that will also give you a 63% probability of detection. So one oral fluid is equal to bleeding 16 pigs in that pen. If you want a 95% prob 95 probability of detection, you need to bleed 25 of those 26 pigs. What if you had a two or more ropes, additional ropes? Yes. Why didn't I talk to Yolanda first, right? <laughs> The que okay, the question is, what if we would have had two ropes per pen? And instead of having 75% participation of pigs, if we would have got the 90%? It's a great question. And if only Yolanda would, had been there to help us. <coughs> but at the very least, at the very least you gotta, you have an, we have an estimate to start with. And that, that's a question for you to get to work on, hopefully. If we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't have to do it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Good point. If we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't have to do it. So, um, so then for me, the other part is, what do these results mean for purge surveillance and elimination programs? 
But also we have all these other questions. How about for pandemic influenza? How about for classical swine fever? How about for African swine fever, foot and mouth, these foreign animal diseases that will someday, uh, we're going to have to deal with. The rest of the world's had to deal with them, and we're going to have to deal with them too. So, so then the fourth study was uh, anti pers antibody in oral fluids. If you remember on the human side, human oral fluid-based diagnostics are primarily using antibody detection, not PCRs. Uh, antibody assays are cheaper than PCRs. A PCR for me costs about 25 bucks, and an antibody assay costs five bucks. And on a pen-based level, you've really kind of lost your, your advantage of pooling serum samples, right? So then you can actually, could gain, theoretically you could gain in terms of uh, lower cost. The, the important thing here is there's a paper that came out in 2005, and it says most serum antibody assays can be optimized to detect antibodies in oral fluid. This is a paper that actually looked at, I think it was hepatitis C. Uh, and you can simply do that by changing incubation times, usually making them longer. Uh, sample dilution, usually not diluting the sample as much. Uh, changing reagent dilutions, and then adjusting the cutoff. Uh, I've had the fortune, good fortune of, of uh, collaborating with Mike Murtaugh at the University of Minnesota. This is some work he did uh, a couple years ago, probably three years ago at least by now, Mike. Uh, and this is showing IgG, IgA, and IgM in oral fluids over time. And for me, the, the, probably the most striking thing here is to recognize that you get a very strong IgM reaction. It's very fast. By day eight, uh, no later than day nine, you have abundant levels of IgM in oral fluids. So you're able to actually uh, detect antibody in oral fluids much earlier than you can, than you can in serum. Uh, and this basically just shows the pattern that Mike saw in, of IgA, IgM, and IgG in oral fluids over time. Uh, here's Bob Rowland, um, and he's done some work on an assay that's called Luminex. It uses uh, microspheres, uh, and he's reporting uh, essentially equivalent stuff, uh, finding IgM, IgG, Ig, and IgG. He did not look for IgG, IgA here. But again, you see roughly around day nine here, you're getting nicely detectable levels of antibody. Uh, additional work from Mike looking at PCV2, just to emphasize the fact that this is not a unique phenomenon to PERS. These are is a PCV2 specific antibody response over time, IgM, IgG, and IgA all in oral fluids. So whatever we can work out for PERS is probably applicable to other agents as well. Uh, John Prickett did some early work with uh, the previous generation of IDEX PERS ELISA, was called the 2XR, and you can see this very uh, strong early response, which we know now is, is based on IgM. When, this, when we first saw the results, it seemed like something was wrong, and so uh, John repeated this on different, uh, on different samples from different experiments, and the, the pattern is very consistent. Uh, so you get this very strong IgM response, and then we saw this decline. But we've been working on, on X3 since then, and uh, we're actually changing the conjugate so that it's a multiple conjugate. Again, we see uh, this is day eight. We don't actually have a sample from day eight, but you can see that they're pretty much negative on day seven and a nice strong response by, by day nine. So these are actually the Bohr samples. So these are individual samples. This is, this is pen-based response. So it will work for pen-based response as well. This is work in progress. This, this has kind of been work in progress for a while now because we've kind of hit a, a sticking point. And the sticking point is that uh, there's, there's always lot-to-lot -lot variability between, between tests that are manufactured, right? So that, so that uh, one lot of kits is slightly different than the next one. Up to now, uh, since you buy those from IDEX or, or from whomever, they adjust the conjugates, the reagents inside those lots, so that you get the same response every time. So that 0.4 is always a cutoff for PERS. Uh, in an oral fluid assay, the sticking point is that we'd have to be doing the adjustment for each lot of kits, which we can do, but then it means it's an Iowa State University specific assay. So we're trying to figure out how we can, we can uh, make this so that it's an assay that's more available to, to more diagnostic labs uh, across the, the U.S. for sure. So that's been kind of some stuff we've been trying to work through, discuss with, with uh, the, the manufacturer. <coughs> something probably you, should, you and I should talk about, Mike. Maybe we can figure something else out. 
Uh, this just shows IgM by itself, and you can see how it declines here. Back here we have not just IgA, IgM, but also IgG and IgA, and you can see that we've been able to reduce this hump in here. So we look, it looks to me like we can have a, an assay that's, that gives a nice reproducible response over time. So the take home on antibody assays, uh, antibody is, is present at diagnostic levels, but we need to work on these assays, and that's actually the, the theme that's recurrent through this whole, whole deal is we need to work on assays, so call your diagnostician up and say, get to work on the assays. Uh, we have tremendous potential for uh, informative and inexpensive assays. You could imagine a, a situation where you could have an IgM-specific assay, so you could look at a, acute infection only. Um, and in, for sure, in the not long term, we have the potential for rapid pig side tests, so that you could, trust, you could test a, a trailer of pigs, uh, either right before they went someplace or right when they were arriving. I should, I should mention one other, one other rapid assay that, that uh, is coming along. Uh, Dr. Locke Carricker at Iowa State has been looking at uh, a kit that's already available, it's already commercially available for, for looking at antibiotics, detecting antibiotics in bulk milk tanks. That test that's already set up for bulk milk works very nicely for oral fluids. The cutoffs, again, have to be adjusted, but the test itself uh, is going to work perfectly fine. Uh, the last part, last part I'm going to talk about is the stability of diagnostic targets in oral fluids. Uh, because the question is, here we, we've got these samples and we know they have diagnostic targets at, at nice levels, but we also know that there's, there's digestive enzymes in these samples, there's plenty of bacterial uh, contamination, there's, oftentimes there's feces. These are all things that could very likely digest or degrade diagnostic targets. So the question was, can we can we actually uh, collect samples and get them to the lab in good shape for testing? So that was, that was the question, and so what we did to, to look at the, at the issue was we looked at, at three different oral fluid treatments. Uh, it's not uncommon to have preservatives keep the bacterial proliferation down so that they can't digest antibodies, for example. We looked at three treatments, no treatment at all, chlorhexidine, and this is actually is cathon, these two preservatives, chlorhexidine, is in your mouthwash. These are both very innocuous, very easily accessible preservatives. Uh, cathon, they use in cosmetics to keep cosmetics from becoming contaminated. So both very safe, very accessible. And then we, we looked at five different temperatures, uh, minus 20, 4, 10. This is roughly 50 degrees Fahrenheit. This is 70 degrees Fahrenheit and then above. And then we just pulled these samples out over time to see what was happening with uh, either virus or anybody. So here's, these are PCR results looking at virus stability by time, temperature, and treatment. Uh, in the, let's see, my colors here are red is cathon, blue is uh, chlorhexidine, and then this one is, is uh, no treatment. What this is showing is that these temperatures are the same. The, th the effect was the same. At minus 20, 4 degrees, that's roughly 40 Fahrenheit, and here's 50 Fahrenheit. Uh, these samples were stable over a period of 12 days, long term, 12 days. Uh, this, this is showing, this line here is showing that chlorhexidine is another PCR inhibitor. You can see how, how nicely reproducible the result is. Chlorhexidine interferes with PCRs. So that would not be a good choice for us. But on the other hand, um, nothing, no preservatives, no, no preservatives whatsoever, and you can see there's no effect on, on our ability to detect uh, virus by PCR. Uh, at 20 degrees, you start seeing some degradation and more so at 30. And ironically, in this case, chlorhexidine did help preserve PCR detectable virus over time. These are uh, ELISA detectable PERS antibodies over time, and we, to get the, to get the antibody levels up high enough, uh, Fernando Osorio from the University of Nebraska provide, provided us some uh, precipitated out antibody, PERS-specific antibody, and we just simply put that in our solution and watched over time. The results are really virtually the same. These temperatures, minus 20, 4, and 10, this 4 being 40 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 being 50 degrees Fahrenheit, again, they're remarkably stable over a 12-day period of time. Here's 20 degrees, you see some degradation, and 30 degrees, 
more degradation. Again, chlorhexidine, chlorhexidine was preservative. And so the take home on stability is uh, the targets we looked at, PERS and per NA PERS antibody, very stable over time at temperatures less than 10 degrees. But the simple thing is collect your samples and freeze them. Pretty easy. We, I think an important question we haven't addressed yet is uh, what are the conditions for long-term storage? Because even serum, if you keep serum at minus 20, that's like your home freezer, antibodies uh, at a home freezer temperature will degrade over time. There's enough enzymatic activity that it'll continue breaking down antibodies. Here we have a more contaminated sample, so we, I think we have to address that issue. Is freezing temperature, standard freezer temperature, is that sufficient to preserve these samples over long term or not? For me, it's a big issue because we keep lots of our samples for multiple years, and we want to be able to, to go back to those samples. So it's, it's an important issue. So just briefly, uh, to go through the five experiments we went to, we saw we had problems with PCRs. We found some solutions to make PCRs better. We need to get more labs running with better PCRs, and we need more people working on finding even better PCRs. Uh, Persheating and oral fluids. Oral fluids are competitive with serum, and maybe better than serum over time. Part of the deal is, is you, you can collect samples more frequently with oral fluids than you're probably going to want to with serum. Uh, limits of purge detection, 64% probability of detecting one viremia pig in a pen of 26. It's a, in, in my opinion, it's awesomely sensitive. And if we get even better PCRs, it could be even better than that. Uh, anti purge antibody in, in oral fluid, we're close, we're not done there. We haven't quite finished the, that project, but that offers the potential to have really cheap, really cheap monitoring tools. Uh, stability. For sure, for diagnostic samples, we know how to, how to keep them intact, freeze them, and they're going to be perfectly fine. For the research setting, I think we still have some questions, but we understand how to take care of diagnostic samples. So we have, uh, at this point in time, we have a process that will work. I think some smart veterinarian or some smart producer is going to find an even better way to collect these samples, cleaner samples uh, to use. We know that, that the PCR stuff works not just for PERS, but we know it works for influenza, for PCV2, for TTV. Uh, we know it actually works for hog cholera. I've got a friend in Taiwan who's been working with oral fluids and for hog cholera. It works great. Um, and we know that we have detectable levels of antibody. We just got to finish getting those assays done. Um, areas that need to work, we need more standardized protocols so that everybody's doing this work the same way so you can compare results. Uh, we have antibody assay development going on at Kansas State, at South Dakota, Ying Fang, uh, is working with Luminex at South Dakota, uh, as well as, some, as an alliance that she's working on. Uh, I know Mike is continuing work at Minnesota, as well as uh, those of Iowa State. Uh, PCR assay development, um, Chris Irwin at Iowa State is working on influenza, improving that one. Uh, I know Aaron Strait is working on m -Hyo. We need to do some work on the bacteria. I know Simone Oliveira at Minnesota has been doing some work. We need to continue. And then we have some of the work on either hog cholera or African swine fever going on elsewhere. There is research that has been started outside the U.S. It's, they're behind us so far, but there is work going on in the U.K., in Denmark, in France, Poland, Spain, Taiwan, uh, and Thailand. So, on, and on some issues that we're not looking at. I know the people in Denmark are interested in salmonella. <laughs>